Who is Bisila Bikoko? Well, I'm African, Spanish, American. Both my parents were forced to immigrate to Spain when they were very young. It was a time of turmoil in Equatorial Guinea. So I realized that we all have a network. And our network is a network. You don't need to really be wealthy to just do something. You can just do whatever you can. So we put the first library in, in Ghana. Why are you so passionate about this subject of helping empower women? When I want to clarify something, I believe in empower women and men. Mm. But I think the mother is the beginning. We could not empower women without empower men because we are complementary. We need both forces. I think that there is a misunderstanding about only empowering women because men also need to be empowered. The reason why sometimes there is this clash is because men don't find their place, women don't find their place. We are trying to publicize the vision and aspirations of the system. We want our people on the ground to understand, to know what the leadership is working towards and how we can help the leadership attain these goals. But the new leadership, it's based in empathy. You have to put yourself in the shoes of others. But in order to put yourself in other people's shoes, you need to take out your own shoes without judgment, without prejudice. This is the African Passport Show. I'm your host, Godfrey Mr. G. Madanire. As the continent works towards the vision and aspirations of Agenda 2063, we need to recognize and appreciate the value and input of those in the diaspora. Today, we are hosting such an amazing global citizen, entrepreneur, and philanthropist, Bisila Bikoko. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gaffrey. It's such a pleasure to be with you here today. Awesome. You were born in Spain. You live in New York, USA but your family roots are in Equatorial Guinea. Now there is a child somewhere in Lagos, Nigeria, in Cairo, Egypt, in Kinshasa, DRC, and they are wondering, who is Bisila Bikoko? Well, I'm African, Spanish, American. I consider myself a cultural hybrid, but the roots of who I am are African. Both my parents, were forced to immigrate to Spain when they were very young. My mother was only 14 years old and my father 17. It was a time of turmoil in Equatorial Guinea because it was just right after the independence and um, the government at that time closed the schools, the churches, everything that had to do with the colony. Uh, President Macias at that time, he completely for what didn't want to have anything to do with things that, re that rem make him, remind him of the colony. So my grandparents decided that for the education of their children, they should send them to Spain so they came very young. And that's why I was born there. Otherwise I was born in Africa. <laughs> okay. oh, yes. But my parents make a lot of effort that I never forget where I coming from and the roots. So in my early years, besides education that I got in the school, they make me read about Pan-Africanism to understand what is the issues of identity that different Africans face, also to see the difference with African-Americans or the Caribbean experience. So very young, I was able to understand what is the things that we go in. It's not the same to be um, a product out of slavery if you're an African-American, that if you're born in the continent after the colonization, and um, they make me understand the things that I will go through. So this is really, Vesila is a person that had to find her own identity, being part of different cultures. And at the same time, I worked to a point that I decided I don't have to choose, I need to be everything. Because when people ask me, where are you from? It was such a difficult question for me to answer because when I say Spanish, people would say, yeah, but Spanish from where? I mean, you, you don't look Spaniard. So, and, and all the time in the school, I have to continuously explain who I was and why I was in that country. So it was always a conflict because when you are a little kid, you just want to be like anybody else and you want to be like everyone. And then when I was 
in the continent, people is like, yeah, but you're not really African. So at the end, I make a decision. I'm African, I'm a Spanish, I am American. I've been 20 years in New York. Um, and why not? I mean, hybrids, we exist. And now because there is such a cross-cultural situation around the world, it doesn't mean that you're not from somewhere. So my level of identity is connected with my roots because that's the beginning. And the story of my family is started there. And then I just continue to integrate in my system different cultures and make a cocktail with it. And I can assure you, we claim you to be one of us. You are one <laughs> of our own, especially because of the things that you are doing all over the world. You are involved in so many projects. Among the projects that you're doing, you are the founder of an African literacy project with presence in a number of African countries. What do you seek to achieve when it comes to this project? Well, I realized that the only difference between me and the children that I met the first time that I put a fit in Africa was that I had access to education. I had the key to be free and to just make a choice about what kind of life I wanted to have. I realized also that there is an African belief that our destiny is not to be changed. This is the destiny that we have and that's it. And I realized through books that it's not like that, that we all can create our own destiny. Yes, you don't choose where you're born. You don't choose the family that you're born, but you could choose what you do from there. The starting point might be very difficult, but it's your responsibility to go in the places that you really want to go. And through books is how I re really realized that because I hear so many times my grandparents say, oh, to be an African is a course or to be black because they were always feeling the depression. Um, both of my grandparents leave. Uh, they have seen people wiped in the colonization. They had memories and they thought that the, the, the destiny is the one that we had, right? And they thought that just because you're European, you have an advantage just for, for that. And then I can only speak through my own experience. I started to read books about personal development and understanding that the brain and the way you believe you could create your life. So when I was in the continent for the first time, I was 35 years old and I decided, you know what, I have to do something. I cannot just be um, going on holiday in Africa and, and, and not be able to give back where I, I, I have been given. And what I was given was the opportunity to have education. So I didn't have the money to, to do a schools or anything like that, but I had the contacts to bring the books in Africa. So I realized that we all have a network and our network is a network. And that's the only strength that I had at that point. And I said, well, you don't need to really be wealthy to just do something. You can just do whatever you can. So we put the first library in, in Ghana. Everything was, uh, you know, that divine intervention. It's not that it was my idea to become a philanthropist, to do a social project. It was just a magical thing. I met the, um, the chief of Kokofu. It's a little village in Ghana. And he invited me to be the queen development mother of the village. And when I asked him, what I'm gonna do with this, because he gave me a piece of land and it was such a beautiful moment. And he said, you will know what to do. Just go home and in three days, give me a call and you will know what to do. And then I have an aha moment and I realized that's it. It must be a library because through books, people will really get to the access to the education. Not all the education has to be in a traditional way. So many things I really self-taught myself through books. So I wanted to give that opportunity and the project was very beautiful. And then we went to Kenya, we went to Zimbabwe. And I, I, planned, I planned this year to open Senegal, but because of the situation with the quarantine yes. and the close of the borders, I couldn't do it. South Africa also, I've been looking into it because the, the, pro, the, the, the problem is the, the rural areas. In most of the cities in Africa, you want to find a library, but what happened with the rural areas? Some kids don't have access. They walk so many kilometers to go to a school and they don't really also get the, the pleasure of reading because if your parents read, there is a very big chance that you end up like reading. But if you don't have that, it's very difficult. So we wanted to teach the kids the pleasure of reading and also involve the family. 
So my team of volunteers go there and read with the family. We don't want to take anybody out. We don't want that there is a generational conflict that this knowledge is going to separate them from them. No, it's all of the opposite. It's going to make us feel good together. So now our experience is reading to these children, inviting the grandparents, inviting the, because Africans, we are storytellers. We love to tell stories and all of these stories, mm -hmm. they're gone when somebody leaves this world because nobody read, write them. I mean, I have so many stories from my grandparents that I just keep in my head and I wish that I had that time to read, to just write them back then, right? Mm -hmm. So I realized that um, all, all the people in stories also could inspire us to do something. Because when you read a biography, it just gives you a boost of energy because you realize that that person started somewhere. And if you read most of the leaders' biographies, you will understand that most of them, they come in from normal families. Not all of them come in from privileged families and they have um, different access to things. They have to fight for them. They just, if they could not have the key to open the door, they just pour down that door down. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You know, we really hope our borders will open again and uh, we'll start traveling so that you can carry on with your mission to help educate the continent, uh, your, your, your mother continent, as it were. Now, I know you also believe in uh, women empowerment. You did a project called Maasai Project through the United Nations. Why are you so passionate about this subject of helping empower women? When I want to clarify something, I believe in empower women and men, mm. but I think the mother is the beginning. We could not empower women without empower men. So I, I need to clarify this because sometimes when they go to schools and they want me to speak with girls, I said, it makes no sense if I don't invite the boys because we are complementary. We need both forces. I think that there is a misunderstanding about only empowering women because men also need to be empowered. The reason why sometimes there is this clash is because men don't find their place, women don't find their place, and then there is a competition here and there is a misunderstanding. I do believe that the mother is the beginning and she, if she's empowered, she will empower also her boys. She will empower everybody. One person that is empowered could not apply violence to make a point because it's empowered enough. So it's not gonna use a tool that is not gonna serve because he's going to use the creativity, he's going to use the communication, he's going to know how to deal with a woman. And I also believe that women need to believe in themselves. And it's so important to start to love yourself because that is going to have an effect in the whole family. When a woman is empowered, empowers her whole family because also she empowers her husband, she empowers her kids. So it's very important. So that's the root. But I also believe that we need to understand that this is not something that we could do separately. We need to do this together. It is so important that we understand that in the 21st century, it's not about women and men. It's about both energy works together. Women have a more creative energy, have more intuition, and they use different capabilities. But you also need the male force because the male force is the executive force. And I believe that if we don't work together, that's why when I go to companies and I do mentoring sessions and I work with different executives, I realize that the best companies are the ones who work in harmonious way, men and women working together. Because the level of compassion and um, the way that women see the world is great, but you also need movement. And the men could take this these this decisions and move things forward. So that's when the companies are in harmony, when you use both energies. All of us, we do have female and male energy within because we come from a man and a woman. So obviously, we also, within ourselves, we need to balance that energy. So that's the work that I'm doing with women, is to balance. Because if a woman uses also too much of the male energy, we also out of balance. And I speak by my experience because I come from a generation that if you wanted to be a leader in a company or something, you needed to act in a certain way that it getting too close to be the male energy. That also takes mm. you out of your, your zone because at the end, it's not your energy. So you need to balance both and understand oh, yes. that you need these tools that 
that, I mean, the universe is so intelligent, God is so intelligent that these two energies need to work together. And we all have them in nothing All of us, we do have them in I'm one sure. way or another. I'm sure I'm, our men somewhere in Casablanca, Morocco, Accra, Ghana, Yaoundé, Cameroon, Conakry, Guinea are getting challenged right now. And they understand that they need to play a role when it comes to working with our women so that they can reach their maximum potential. Now, when you look at um, the development of uh, the girl child or women in general, as compared to the rest of the world, how do you think Africa is performing? Well, Africa has different countries, so it's changing from one country to another. We could not speak about Africa like a whole continent when it comes to different policies and because all of this is also connected with the culture. So it depends on our culture, uh, depends also of the government policies that they have, the girls will be more or less empowered. What I will say is that I have seen in the last 10 years a huge development in general that people understand. And I will say in African behalf that women are in many cases more empowered than women in the uh, United States or in Europe and even Latin America. You will see that it's more women in the parliament in Africa than in Latin America or even in some countries in Europe. So Africa is advancing because there is an ancient wisdom in some cultures that they understand real the power of women. I think Africans, we've been subjected to a little bit of confusion in general, but within ourselves, we understand the power of the mother. We understand the power of women and girls to be empowered. So I think that we're going to a great direction and I've been working with youth and it's beautiful to watch that the youth is starting to understand that the role that they need to play in the continent is essential to change things. We rely on them because the previous generations, we already come with very established belief systems. But now is the opportunity to see other role models, to see other ways of doing things. And they could not blame this to the old generations. I mean, we have to stop blaming others. So now if they listen to this, they need to take responsibility for their own and to, to change the status quo and, and really believe in themselves. And girls have a great, great um, path to follow in the new story and the new narrative of Africa. Yes. And uh, just like you, there is a lot of Africans that are outside the continent, they're in the diaspora, uh, as well as other people that just love Africa. They might not be Africans. How do you think they can play a role in helping Africa attain the vision and aspirations of Agenda 2063 as we work towards building the Africa that we want? Well, I think the diaspora also play a very important role. And Africans love by many, many people, because my understanding, and I have seen a lot of people who really wanted to help, even without being Africans or never had a connection with Africa, they feel that the energy of Africa, it's a great energy. Also in the political level, if you see the geopolitics system right now, Africa always has been the forgotten continent, but now that the world is shifting and the balance of power is changing, Africa is gonna play a huge role. And the diaspora will not only be the ones helping Africa, but also Africa is not gonna be the person to be helped. Africa is gonna be the one helping others because mm -hmm. always we're thinking that the help is gonna come from outside and the people should contribute to Africa. But what about what Africa can contribute to the world? I know right now that Europeans are isolated. A lot of, they complain about the immigration waves, but if they put the efforts, instead of the stopping these borders and the immigration, if they put efforts in having a connection with Africa and work with them, do companies, create employment, this will change. Why United States have a politic uh, situation right now that is all about themselves. The, 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 the role of being the saviors of the whole world in this particular moment is not happening. We see China in one place, we see United States, Europe, it's right there, kind of crumbling also because the, the European Union, UK just left and everything. So Africa is in a very important role to also change the narrative and contribute to the world and unify the world and bring a different story in the world. So I think if 
we all understand that, we will realize that it's not only about what other people could do to Africa, but what Africa could do to the world. We need to also get confident that Africa has so much to offer. And if we know that, that Africa could be the best partner for other, con for other continents and to work together. And I do believe that there is African talent. There is also a youth with amazing creativity, the level of technology. We didn't have an industrial revolution, but we have a technological revolution. We bring in solutions to the world that maybe people never thought about it. And I do believe that if we do that, Africa will have also something to give to the world. Not only the world will give to Africa. Now, you mentioned a number of things that are so great about the African continent. Now, let's look at the other side. What are some of the challenges do you think the African continent is facing right now? Well, the biggest challenges that we have is that still we don't have the good governance. We still mm. don't have a system that the citizens have a place to speak. The, the voices of a lot of people are quiet. It's still there is systems that people don't feel free to speak. So we need to shake up these systems because that is hurtful. We only could work and change our narrative when we work together. We could not hold into power and understanding that power is a personal power. The power is the people power. So until we understand that, and we also could not rely everything in the government, also we could not blame everything in the government. Of course, our governments have a lot of improvement to make, but it's also part of the citizenship to make the decisions about how they want that we manage our countries, what things matter to us. It is not okay that people have no access to education or health at this point. We could not continue to look back and say always, no, no, it's the, the problem is they're all colonies, they don't allow us to grow. All of this is an old narrative. We need to change the narrative. So I, I see that besides that our governments are not functional enough to give us the opportunity to have a better life, we also, like Africans, we also have to change the way we think. Because I see that a lot of people have still a very negative belief system. They are feeling hopeless inside and they believe that they're not in charge of their own destiny. And while Africans, we continue to be victims, we continue to live with these stories and always complaining or not lifting up each other, because it's very important that we lift up each other. I take that responsibility to lift up my sisters and my brothers and my capacity, in my capability, it doesn't matter. But if someone has gone one step up at the level, their obligation is to hold the hand on the next one. Because this way we all will be going up. If one person has the power and have the opportunities and just keep it for itself, it's lost back then. So I think it's a matter of changing our belief system because we could complain about our health system, of our infrastructures, everything, but everything starts in our belief system. So as like Africans, we need to make inner work to really believe more in ourselves. The moment that you change yourself, you change the world. We could not always think in that the enemy is outside. The first enemy is within us. Oh yes, oh, that's so profound, that's so profound. Now, I know you have done a lot of work with the United Nations, if you were to be approached by the African Union today, and they say, Bisila Bikoko, can you please give us some advice on how we can work towards achieving our set of objectives? What would you say? I would say when I read the document of the African Union about the Agenda 2063, I thought, huh, you see, it is very important to have these big, big plans, but mm. my, my own experiences have big dreams and do a small steps. I don't see the small steps that we need to take every single day to get to that agenda. We have 50 years to change when they, this was drafted. It was with that idea. But where are, I mean, 10 years have passed. Did we did a balance sheet about where we were and where we are right now? If I see the balance sheet, I see it still negative. I don't see a big, and the thing is because we have big dreams and big dreams require baby steps. And we need to draft that strategy to see how we get to big dreams. When I see my 20, 
years of career, of course I have huge dreams, but every single day I have to walk toward that dream. And that draft, I don't see it. So that's what I will say to the African Union. And this is also not a work of only the governments. They have to give us homework. What is the homework for the, all of us? How we could change that? This is not something that the governments are gonna do by themselves. I mean, I love these principles and the seven aspirations are amazing. And I, of course, I want to see that. I want to go and walk in Africa and feel that is Wakanda. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that we have this opportunity oh, yeah. to just bring the best of ourselves, that we could give the beautiful technology to the world, that we could definitely, people don't have to leave the continent and die like so many people to go to Europe and to everybody writes me, oh, I want to come to America. How could I come to America? So many young people, they don't see that they are, they, they're only thinking about the American dream. Where is the African dream? I want to see the African dream, that other people want to go to Africa and excel in our continent. For that, this will be the question. It's not only what you put in the paper, it's what do you do every single day. Oh, yes. And uh, in this sense, you are saying to the leadership, as the citizens, we are available. We want to work with you. Exactly. This vision can only be possible if we work together. Exactly. And that's very important. And that is why we even came up with this initiative of, uh, you know, when it comes to this African passport show, we are trying to publicize the vision and aspirations of Agenda 2063. We want our people on the ground to understand, to know what the leadership is working towards and how we can help the leadership attain those goals. Also because the new leadership, it's based in empathy. You have mm. to put yourself in the shoes of others. But in order to put yourself in other people's shoes, you need to take out your own shoes without judgment, without prejudice. A lot of the people who are leading right now, they never took out their shoes to put themselves in the shoes of others, the citizenship, mm. to understand what the citizenship's doing or need or listen to them. If we don't do that, all of this will continue to be only a dream, aspirations. It will not be things that we could leave. And I think they need to lead us with empathy, with their hearts, not only based on economic models and just see how much people you could benefit from your circle. This is not taking us where we want to go. So when you apply empathy, and you, for one second, take out your shoes and you put yourself in the other people's shoes, there is something that you will understand. You will open your heart to understanding. So if I'm, am I correct if I'm to say Bisila Bikoko is calling for the leadership to connect with people on the ground? Absolutely, uh, uh, yes, exactly, that's what I want. I want that really to connect with the people, that they open their hearts to really listen and to feel what people feel. Now, Bisila, in 2019, you received a Citizen of the World Award from the United Nations. How did that make you feel? That's huge. <laughs> I, I could only say that I was in disbelief when they wrote me and they told me, as a matter of fact, it was very interesting because I was always contributing to this gala that they make every year and I always give gifts, so I do any kind of contribution. So when I saw the email for the first time, end of August, I, th I, I just don't even read it because I was thinking, oh, okay, they're asking me for my contribution, so when I come on holiday, I will just do something. So then one of the members of the committee called me and said, but you didn't give us an answer. Are you available this day to receive the award? And I said, what award? Because I didn't even read the email. And, and then she explained me, please read the email and call me back. And I read that I was in disbelief. And I mean, awards only, it's, um, it's only a recognition of what, what you've been doing. But I realized that this is who I was. I was always a citizen of the world. I was always trying to understand different cultures and see myself like a human being and understand that everybody else is a human being. So I always call myself a humanist because this is who we are. We are all humans. And I don't see colors. I don't see sexes. I don't see anything. I see a human being that 
every human being has the same dreams, the same needs. And that's why it was really, um, maybe of all the words that I received through my life, it was the one that I really enjoyed. Normally I feel very, I have always mixed feelings and I, I, I don't really sometimes be celebrating that awards and I, sometimes it's just this embarrassment of being recognized. I do what I do because I want to do it. But that day I did, no, 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 I'm going to celebrate. So I dance African music. I took a nice bath. I prepare myself to go to the party and just have fun because it was really the award that I thought that really represent who I am. And besides the award, I always, felt that I was that. That's who I wanted to be all my life. So it was just a and confirmation. I think, <laughs> and I think it's very important, you know, when you get appreciated, when you got the, when you get the recognition for the good work that we do, it can only propel us to do much, much more. And uh, we are so grateful that you are doing this to help our world become a better place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Godfrey. And I think that we all could do our part. I mean, my message to the youth is, I was also a confused kid, um, normal kid with an immigrant family. My parents, when they had me, they were only 22 years old. They didn't have much. And they, have, they were in a different country trying to raise for kids. I, my childhood was not easy, not easy at all, dealing with different traditions that sometimes clubs with each other. Also parents that they were not emotionally able to be there. But no matter what, I, you write your own story. You could change the pages of the book. And this is one thing that my father told me always, you know, you are black and you're a woman. So you have not things easy, but you could make things easy because when you see only the possibilities instead of the limitations, you could make things easy. It depends on what glasses you want to see the world. You could see the world only like a place that is so difficult and dangerous out there, or you could see the world like a place full of possibilities, opportunities, and you just want to go and grab them, open the doors for you. So it's, it's, you could definitely make it. What I'm doing, it's, it's in the hands of everyone. So I'm not different. I am you. Absolutely. And I can assure you that today you inspired a young girl that is seated somewhere in Tripoli, Libya, a young boy that is seated somewhere in Kigali, Rwanda, or a young man that is seated somewhere in Banjul, the Gambia. And they are inspired. They will go out there and they will make a difference on the African continent as well as in the whole world. Now, there is a Kenyan proverb which says, teeth that are together help each other in chewing food. There's also another African proverb which says, if you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Agenda 2063 is not about being swift. It is not about speed. It is all about getting there and establishing Africa as a global powerhouse. And together with people like you, Bisila, we can make it happen and we can establish the African continent as a global power. Thank you very much for being available for this interview. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Tune in next week, same time, same place, but remember to like, share, and subscribe. Do not miss the next episode of the African Passport Show as we publicize and promote the vision and aspirations of Agenda 2063. Let us work towards the Africa we want.